I'd like to start out by asking you to participate in um, some statements of affirmation. And by that I mean I'm going to make some statements and if those statements are true for you, I want you to say, that's me. Okay? I like ice cream. Must not like it very much, but I look forward to hearing Mitch Wilburn on Sunday. I enjoy the Wednesday night summer series. Men are better drivers than women. <laughs> Women are better drivers than men. Yay. Now for something uh, a little more personal. I am a fan of the OU Sooners. I am a fan of the OSU Cowboys. Okay. Divided households. <laughs> I am prejudiced. I don't trust men named Muhammad. Prejudice is a part of our human existence. It simply means to prejudge. And we judge people without knowing their circumstances or their history or much about them because we're busy and there are a lot of people. And sometimes you have to make quick decisions. And so we put people into categories as a way of simplifying the task we have at assessing people. And in our current environment, we are a culture that is suspicious of men of a certain age from the Middle East because of 9-11. There's lots of research into social judgment errors and what leads us to make these kinds of judgments. But I thought I would turn to one of the preeminent scholars on this subject, uh, and that's Shrek. You know what I think? I think this whole wall thing is just a way to keep somebody out. No. Do you think? Are you hiding something? Never mind, donkey. Oh, this is another one of those onion things, isn't it? No, this is one of those drop it and leave it alone things. Well, why don't you want to talk about it? Why do you want to talk about it? <laughs> well, why are you blocking? I'm not blocking. Oh, yes, you are. Donkey, I'm warning you. Who are you trying to keep out? Just tell me that, Shrek. Who? Everyone, okay? Oh, now we're getting somewhere. Oh, for the love of Pete. Hey, what's your problem, Shrek? What you got against the whole world anyway? Huh? Look, I'm not the one with the problem, okay? It's the world that seems to have a problem with me. People take one look at me and go, Ah, help! Run! A big, stupid, ugly ogre. <sighs> they judge me before they even know me. That, in a nutshell, is prejudice. Judging ogres before you know them just because they're big, green, and ugly, and they have a reputation. Well, one of the roles that Christ played in his ministry was to break apart prejudices, break apart the prejudging of people. And I want you to go with me to a few passages 
in the Gospel of Luke. So if you have your Bibles or you have your phone and you can pull up Luke. You know, Luke is considered to be the Gospel writer who wrote particularly for a Gentile audience. He writes both the Gospel of Luke and Acts. And so he includes some stories that I think are intended to show the Greeks, the Gentiles, Jesus didn't dismiss you. The Christ did not discard you. Some of his greatest moments were with people like you. In Luke chapter 4, verse 23, Jesus is in Capernaum, and he's not gotten a very good reception, honestly, from his hometown, from the people who knew him before he began his ministry as the Christ. And so he says to them in verse 23, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elisha's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Now that doesn't sound like a shocking passage to us because we've heard it many times. And after all, we are the Gentiles who want to be included in God's love and plan and kingdom. But Jesus says, you're thinking, do some great miracles. But a prophet never gets honor in his own country. And then he gives two examples of great miracles God performs. But not for the many widows in Israel. But for a Gentile widow. And all the lepers in Israel went unhealed, but... A man named Naaman is healed who is not a Jew. Now turn a couple of chapters over to Luke 7. Verse 1, when Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some of the elders of the Jews to ask him, to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this. Because he loves our nation and he has built our synagogues. So Jesus went with him. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. This is why, that is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed 
And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Here is a Gentile with great faith. Now, the Jewish leaders liked this guy. He had done some things for Israel. But a man of great faith? Stay in Luke 7, but look at verse 36. This is a story about a meal. A Pharisee has Jesus come to dinner and he has invited the important people, the respectable people that he knows and that are allied with him. And while he's there, a woman comes in a woman with a very bad reputation and she wets his feet with her tears and washes them and the Pharisee is appalled. Can you, um, do you see he's letting this woman touch him? Nothing but disdain for the woman. But Jesus says to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. It's surprising to the religious leaders that he is praising a woman with a reputation, with a terrible reputation. Turn to Luke chapter 10, verse 25. You know the story well. Jesus tells a story about a man who's traveling down a road and he gets mugged. He is attacked. They strip him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, who is the hero in this story? A priest happened to be going down the road, the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three is the hero. Which one is the neighbor? It is the least likely of the trio. It is a Samaritan. Now turn to Luke 17. Again, a familiar story. Jesus, in verse 11, is on his way to Jerusalem. 
And as he's going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Now, these passages don't upset us because we don't have a prejudice against the Samaritans or against the Romans. Or against other people outside of Israel. But Jesus is lifting up people who were not a part of the Israel nation. And he's saying God can work through them and is working through them. And they are doing Good in the world. Now, my topic in this series talks about Jesus, conqueror of the world, for humanity. And it's kind of an awkward way of saying... Jesus Christ did a lot of good for a lot of people and it wasn't just with the select few. He has a worldwide emphasis and there are so many ways in which Christ, this man born in poverty, born in a barn, and laid in a feeding trough, he changes the world. Now we know that he establishes the church, and we are familiar with with the good that he does in the church. But what I would like to suggest to you tonight is that the good that Jesus did and does extends beyond the boundaries or borders of our churches. There is something infectious about Christ and his words and his ways that change the world. Now I'm going to give you one example. I probably have enough material for a couple of classes, but you'll be thankful that I limit it to one. But turn, if you would, to Matthew 18. I, I can't think offhand how many times the disciples, the apostles, had this discussion about who is the greatest. But this was one of those times. At the time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such, a, one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones to stumble, 
it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. One of the most severe warnings Christ ever gives. You recall the time that the apostles tried to keep the little kids away? And Jesus says, quit that. Let the children come to me. And what I'd like to suggest to you in the time we have remaining is that Christ started something with children. God started something with children that blesses kids in many places and in many ways. You may have heard, but I'll just remind you, that both the Greeks and the Romans had a law that infants could be put to death if they were not acceptable to the parents, specifically to the father. In fact, it was a law that a damaged child, a deformed child, was to be put to death. But in the Roman Empire, the value of an infant was very, very low. They would bring the infant to the father of the family and he would either Take up the child and own it or lead the child to be taken out and exposed to the wild where animals and the weather uh, ended their lives. Now, contrast that with what Jesus is saying about these little ones. He is going to change the way people think about children. He's saying, you need to value these little ones. And he's going to make a big difference in how children are treated throughout the world. Now I have an inscription an image of an inscription. This is a plaque standing in a place where they used to abandon children. And what the plaque essentially says is that anyone who abandons a child, him or her, they will either be excommunicated or have other maledictions. They're going to be guilty of a crime against the church. Now this is Pope Paul III writing this November 12, 1548. And so, we see the effect that Christendom, the Catholic Church, but still a, a, a movement that is influenced by Christ, doing something for children. They finally say, okay, that's enough. We're not going to do this. We're not going to abandon children they're going to be taken to monasteries. They're going to be taken into safe places. We're not going to kill the little ones anymore. 
Now, how did that change occur? Well, I have a theory, and part of it comes from a picture of, it would be the Madonna picture. This is a painting from the middle centuries called Madonna of the Book. And it is painted to say something about Christ. And these were some of the earliest paintings in the Middle Ages. Paintings of Christ and his mother. Now, a few things you'll notice about the painting. They have halos around their heads. Okay? So a child with a halo, obviously, that's the Christ child. But it communicates the value of children. Now, the painting is full of symbolism. She is looking at what is essentially a book of prayers. The child, supposed to be the Christ child, is holding three nails in one of his hands to represent his death on the cross. There's some fruit that represents purity as well as sacrifice. But these kinds of pictures are beginning to show up throughout the Middle Ages. And they have this angelic view of children. Where does that come from? I would suggest to you that comes from Christ. Saying, value these little ones. And the story of Christ being born in humble circumstances. That the artist picked up on those words and those images and they started painting children as being very important. Okay, now the other picture is entitled Care for Orphans by Jean Debray. It is painted in 1663 and what it represents is the caring for children in a very practical way. This is a man and a woman known in a Holland community named Harlem. And it shows children um, that are being cared for by these parents. And the idea of... Christian parents caring for children who have been abandoned begins to spread throughout uh, Europe and it will uh, grow to England and to the United States. Um, essentially, we're talking about orphanages. Places where children without parents or without responsible parents are raised. How many of you have ever been a part of a church that supported a children's home or an orphanage? Now, churches of Christ have a long history. Do you know how many children's homes are in Oklahoma that uh, are supported by churches of Christ? Turley is one. Tipton. Westview. Hope Harbor. Yeah, Turley turned into Hope Harbor. Right. Okay, I think there are five. Texas has about 15. And this was related to the church's effort 
to take seriously the words of Christ. And that is, take care of these little ones. Value these little ones. Because they are extremely vulnerable. The first orphanage in the United States was established in 1729 in Missouri. But before that, they were farmed out to various people who were just, hopefully, good people. Um, has anybody heard of the orphan train? Orphan train, yeah. There's a book, a fictional book about, uh, kind of like historical fiction, about this train that would load up children abandoned and living on the streets of New York City and they would be brought west to farms and communities and make stops and people would walk through the kids and choose one to take home. There were maybe 150 to 200,000 children who were given homes in that way. Now, I'd like to say that those were all happy stories. But sometimes the children were beaten, mistreated. Uh, they didn't go to Christian homes. Well, just after orphanages got started, uh, we had the Industrial Revolution around the turn of the century in the 1900s. And in the Industrial Revolution, children were put to work, often at very dangerous jobs. Children as young as four years old work long hours in dangerous conditions. They would work on machines, they would sell newspapers, they would break up coal at coal mines, they would work as chimney sweeps. And businesses hired them because they were cheap. Sometimes they didn't have to pay them anything, just gave them a place to sleep and a little bit to eat. But it was obviously the exploitation of children because they were not receiving appropriate medical care or an education. Well, one of the heroes to this particular chapter in caring for children, valuing children, is a man named James Kirkland. At 34 years old, he became the chancellor for Vanderbilt. And Vanderbilt, until 1910, was associated with the Methodist Church. And he grew up as a minister's son. And he becomes very concerned about these, this child labor. And he goes and he speaks at a hearing on child labor that they held to try to figure out what should we do. I want to read a portion of his speech. He says, The reason we have not a better condition of things in this country is that the Christian men and women of Atlanta and Nashville and New Orleans and every southern city and every city in this country do not care for these things and are indifferent as to their children. This state of things will not be remedied unless under compelling law of human interest. And when we want these things, we shall have them. My proposition, therefore, is that it is your duty and my duty to busy ourselves with the ethical concern of the state. It is somebody's business to take an interest in these things. It's somebody's business to say to capital, you may mortgage the streets of our cities. You may bond our railroads. 
You may syndicate the water we drink. You may lay hands on the very air that we breathe. But you shall not mortgage the children of this generation. You shall not blight in earliest bud the manhood and womanhood of the next generation. We want the church to be busy about this matter. It will be a better thing for churches to do than running the Wednesday night prayer meeting. We want the state to be busy about this. We want the churches to build chapels and Sunday school rooms and ring out the chimes from every steeple. And we want the state and church to cry out with the cry of our master. Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for of such is the kingdom of God. Of heaven. This man heard the plight of children and he responded to it. Not just a certain group of kids, he's concerned about all children, a generation of children. Now, we don't do orphanages much anymore, children's homes much anymore. Unfortunately, there was a great deal of scandal and abuse that followed some of those homes. It seems that wherever you put children, there are predators who will seek them out. And so we shifted to foster care and also to adoption. And I don't know how many of you have adopted a child out of the system, DHS, Department of Human Services. But these are very challenging kids and they make up a high percentage of the number of kids that I see every day in my practice. And they are challenging kids. When you have been damaged at an early age, then you have problems that are hard to resolve as older children and teenagers. There are some statistics that have come out recently in studies that nearly half of foster children in the United States become homeless when they turn 18. One out of one of every 10 foster children stays in foster foster care longer than 7 years and each year about 15,000 reach the age of majority and leave foster care without a permanent family. Many join the ranks of the homeless or to commit crimes and be imprisoned. Three out of ten of the United States homeless are former foster children. According to the results of the Casey Family Study of foster care alumni, up to 80% are doing poorly, with a quarter to a third of former foster children at or below the poverty level, three times the national poverty rate. Very frequently, people who are homeless had multiple placements as children. Some were falling in foster care. Others experienced unofficial placements in homes of family and friends. But they all had a difficult path. So what does that say to us? If we are going to embrace the word and will of Christ, then we need to look for ways to help children. Help these children who have grown up in foster homes and don't have any place to go when they turn 18. We need to think creatively. We need to invest some of our energy. I think that is a Christ inspired cause and it is bigger 
than a church committee or a ministry. It is something that all of us can do in looking out for a little child. I'll tell you that one of the hardest experiences for mothers of these children is when they take them to the grocery store or to Walmart and the kid throws a fit. I call it low frustration tolerance. <laughs> Practically speaking what it means is they spot a toy they want and they're going to throw a fit because their parents said no. But guess how the spectators respond to those parents? Why don't you do something with that kid? If you'd bust his butt, he wouldn't do that. Not knowing any of the circumstances. Not knowing how difficult it is. It is so discouraging to these foster moms to have innocent bystanders judge them for not being able to control the child who cannot control himself or herself. And I tell you, kids are getting smart about how they manipulate parents. They say, She's hurting me. What? Now try to sort that out. Is the child being hurt? Or is the child manipulating the system because they know the parent's going to back off if they say, she's hurting me. Sometimes the children will make up a story and take it to school. I'm not being fed at home. And teachers report that to DHS and there's an investigation and it's all fiction. So teachers have a very hard time sorting out what's true and what's not. But we need to get to know these families. If you're not raising a foster child an adopted child, then be part of their extended family. Have them over for a holiday. Have them over for the 4th of July. Give them a bigger family experience. Support the parents. Give the parents a break. Let them go out on a date night while you babysit. Advocate for children. Be a reader for children at school. I spend every day, all day, working with children. And one of the reasons that I work with children is because kids change. Now you can work with an adult for 10 years and they'll change about that much. But you work with a child, put him or her in a healthy environment, and they blossom, and they get better, and they're happier. So, there's something in it for you if you'll invest in children. But let me tell you, I hear, as you do, that Sunday school teachers, children's class, Needs teachers. You know. So there are plenty of opportunities to serve kids both in this congregation and in this community and in the world. We support a child in Africa. You can sponsor a child through a, a valid and reliable uh, ministry or mission effort. There are a lot of ways to help children. 
And I'd just like to suggest that Jesus wants us to serve children and to value them. And that's one of the ways in which he has blessed humanity. Would you bow with me for a prayer? Heavenly Father, when we hear words like overcome and victory, stirs up a lot of different ideas and images. But we just pray that you would help us join that effort that Christ began in loving and serving everyone we encounter and especially children. Let us look for ways to lift them up, to help them, because we know that we can do good if we will but give some time and attention and energy to those kids and to those parents that are trying to raise them. Thank you for giving us this time to think together about your son and his magnificent life and how he changed the world in so many ways. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's show our thanks to Dr. Jones.